happy I am to be here because um, when you tell people in my village uh, you are going to the United States in a place called Little Rock, they will say, Efa. <laughs> yes, because the, the, the work they are doing there is, is very, very close to people. It's close to the, the ordinary person. So that's interesting. And then the second thing is President Clinton. <laughs> you know? And, and, and so today when I came here, um, I, was, I was very, very, very happy because I had the opportunity to tour the library. And as we were watching, I saw a school when, 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 when President Clinton was in Uganda. And that school is exact about 100 meters from my house. So I was like, whoa! <laughs> this is nice. So it, it feels at home here. And, uh, so I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. And, but uh, when, when Alex was uh, uh, introducing me, he mentioned some things about uh, my life which, which, which are uh, sometimes a bit difficult. So I want to first demystify that by playing music for you so that you calm down. <laughs> and, uh, but the music I'm going to play is a song that is, is my first English song that I wrote recently. Um, and uh, the song is, is called Cry, Okelo Cry, because when I was, uh, when I was abducted, uh, let, me, let me take it back. When I was growing up as a young boy, our parents always told us that boys never cry. You know, a man does not cry. But I realized that actually crying is, is very resourceful because the only peaceful moment I got when I was in captivity were those moments that I stepped aside and found the moment to just cry. And after that, I felt a lot of peace in myself. So I, that's the song I want to, to play a bit, and then we can start to you know, share ideas. say I'm really honored to be speaking here tonight because um, to speak in an institution like this where you have a lot of young people you know starting life especially in the public service you know getting focused in the public service at a moment in our life now that is very delicate 
I, 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 I feel very honored because we are at a, a stage in our life that you wonder why a simple amateur video can cause so much problem, you know? So it's, it's for me an honor to be here because then I become part of a conversation into the search of the long process of peace. And, and, I, and that's one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be here. So I want to, to start by, first of all, sharing my story. Alex talked about it, but I want to, to get a little bit detailed so that, and that's, that's all I need to do. And then I, 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 I raise some, 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 you know, some issues, some, some opinions that I think we could, you know, work together towards. Um, I was born in northern Uganda on the 8th of December in the good 60s. I was born in 1986. 19, 1969 in December. I was born the third child in a family that included one father, three wives, and 20 siblings. So my, my, my father was busy. <laughs> my mother, Eromina Lal Otinglae, was the first of my father, Onega Sam's wife. So one day while I was walking to school, when I was 16, and returning during a vacation to pick up test results that dictated whether one passes to the next class, a group of other kids and I were abducted into the rebel army of the now defunct UNLA. I'm going to refer to a lot of armies in Uganda, and that tells you the challenge that that region has. And uh, sometimes when, when, when I talk about the UNLA, the, the Lord's Resistance Army, the Holy Spirit Movement, there's a lot of rebellion and a lot of things occurring and you wonder, you know, what is wrong? And so I, I was abducted by the UNLA of General Basilio Larokelo. All of the kids were transported to the rebel army camp in southern Sudan and then to different war fronts in northern Uganda after a nightmarish two weeks basic training at our own high school. I found it very tragic that it is at my high school where I'd gone to pick my results was where I was trained to be a soldier. Um, after the training, which took just two weeks. We were tortured and there was a lot of brainwashing. The UNLA had been the legitimate army of the Uganda until the current president, President Yoweri Museveni, took over power. He was running also a rebel group called the National Resistance Movement or Resistance Army. When they took control in January 1986, the other army was sent away. So while trying to return to power by fomenting rebellion, the UNLA abducted young soldiers known as the Kadogos for their struggle. Kadogo is a Swahili word for the small one. Eh? Kito Kidogo. It means a child, the young ones. So we were, we were given that name, eh, the small one, but still put to fight. I was there until about between 18 to 24 months after my abduction. Then during a pitch battle, I chose my moment and escaped. And, and I want to say I chose my moment because there were two choices I had. Either to try to escape and fail, and that would mean you would be killed, or to try to escape and just go. And so I chose my moment and then escaped. I relied on my wits and stealth to make my way homeward. But I found northern Uganda embroiled in chaos, challenged by both Alice Lakwena 
Rebels of Holy Spirit Movement, and a scourge of vicious Karmojong cultural wrestlers. I snuck onto a truck traveling to Gulu, where I had heard my family was likely taking shelter from the chaos. Unfortunately, they were not there. And even though I had heard my home village was deserted, I decided to, you know, just go check it out myself. So I had a ride with several other travelers on the back of a large truck filled with big canister of paraffin for lambs. For those, there was uh, someone I met for lunch who was staying in Oima. You, you, you know the, the, the small tadoma, eh? That's what we used to put paraffin. So this truck was filled with paraffin and then we got into the truck and started traveling. Unfortunately for us, we got into an ambush of the Holy Spirit movement of Laquena. And so they shot and we were lucky because they, we were sitting on top of, of the canisters. So there was a lot of paraffin flowing everywhere. There was fire and we had no other alternative because by that time my old body was white burned completely and that's how I found myself together with the other passengers on our way back to Kampala. When I came to Kampala I had one information that I was armed with. My family had spoken proudly of an uncle making a living in the capital. So armed with this name Odong and the name of his employer, the company Kovmo, I searched the city and managed to find my unknown relative. My uncle was a driving school instructor with two wives and four children living in a two-roomed house in a slum known as Naguru. They found room for me, a mat in their floor, so then I started life again. I washed cars, I collected water, I washed people's clothes with one driving factor, raise money, go back to school. So, by the end of 1988, picking up from where I had left, at senior two, I went back to school. By 1991, I was in junior college at Makere University, pursuing a diploma in the performing arts. While in secondary school, I had encountered a dance company called Ndere Troop and became obsessed. A dance company came to my school for a theater show and they had a play that had all the traditional dances and music of, of our people, you know, put into a play. But we had to pay to go to watch this show. And I didn't have money, I didn't have enough money even to pay my school fees. So, for those of you who have traveled to Africa, you know that you have normally the dining halls and the windows are quite, you know, easy to access. So I started to try to access the production from the window. And the director of the play would come and chase me away. So then I would run the other way because I really wanted to see it. It was something new, something interesting. And then he kept on chasing me away. Then I realized that there was need for teamwork. So I mobilized other students like me who could not Pay. And I say, you stand there, you stand there. So we were, <laughs> we were all over the windows. And the director soon realized that actually I was the problem. <laughs> and so he came to me and asked me, and I was very honest to him. I said, I really don't have money. And I don't see you coming back here soon. I need to see this. So I beg you, allow me to sit down on the floor and that will do it for me. And he was kind enough 
He allowed me, and now I had a team behind me, so I needed to advocate for them too. <laughs> so I advocated for all those who were buying. So we were given the opportunity to sit on the floor and watch the play. I got very intrigued by the play, you know. And so I, I requested him again to interview me, to allow me to join the company, which he did. So I soon got opportunity to be interviewed and I became very successful in this company. And soon I was rising, I became a dancer, a choreographer, played instrument. During the time I was with them, brought them to Brooklyn Academy of Music, toward Chicago, toward the whole of Europe, became very successful. I became the artistic director of the company. And life was becoming to be, beginning to be very good. Now, while in college, I met and married a professional educator, beautiful woman called Marian Lubega. And on August 18th, 1994, we had our first child, a daughter named Laweno Miki Marilyn. In 1996, I began work on my bachelor's degree at Makere University. And the future was looking bright when tragedy struck again. My teenage brother, Godfrey, was abducted from the boarding school along with 50 other children by Joseph Cohn, Lord's Resistance Army, the rebel successor of Alice Laquena of the Holy Spirit. Rumors of his survival gave our family hope until one morning in 1998, when I opened the morning paper to a gruesome photographs of 300 people killed and dismembered in my village. <clears throat> I saw my relatives, my friends, people I went to school with slaughtered, and when I got the news, I broke down. No matter when I tell my story, this is one of those moments in my story that is very heavy. But I will tell you uh, soon, I will tell you soon why I, I always tell this story. So I got into my car. I had a car. I had a car. I had become very successful. I got into my car, driving towards the north, towards the war zone. I wanted to do something. A friend had joined me in the ride to persuade me that driving back into the war zone was too dangerous. But I had to do something. So I kept on driving and driving and driving. And I stopped. And when I stopped, an idea came to my mind. And that idea was, get whoever you can from the north to move south across the Nile. It is safe. So that was the day I bought land. That very day in 1998, I bought land in a village called Kitwanga a safe area just beyond the war zone protected by the Nile River. You know, Nile River, for those of you who have not been to Uganda, it's not easy to cross. <laughs> because, let alone the fact that it is fast, it has enough crocodile to maintain you out. <laughs> and I started a large rural campus where refugees, orphans, and eventually, former child soldiers found a place to call home. I realized that to build the condition for peace, we must educate and empower youths. Almost 15 years later, my safe refuge has evolved into Hope North, an accredited secondary school with an international art center, vocational training, and a working farm, staffed by 28 
dedicated Ugandan educators. Over 3,000 vulnerable youths have lived at Hope North, and today we have 255 incredible youths who are working towards their degrees and planning careers. <coughs> if peace were to truly take hold in the region, maybe Hope North will have served its purpose. Until then, our concept is evolving. To pursue that end, I still make weekly drives to Hope North, juggling my family life and my many commitments as a professional performer, including my new dance company. When I say performer, I, have, I do acting also in film. I've been in the film The Last King of Scotland, if you have seen it. Um, I choreographed the dance in The Last King of Scotland. And that's how I met Forrest Whitaker. I've been in a film called Mississippi Masala. I've been in a few films. So uh, my life is very artistic and interesting. I, but I also have a company called Mizizi Ensemble, which provides artistic development, residency, and scholarship to 30 youths drawn from Hope North and all regions of Uganda and has become one of the country's leading cultural performance group, drawing inspiration from the diverse traditional art forms of the people of Uganda, including dance, music, storytelling, instrumentation, and instrument making. I have made Hope North a hub for visiting artists who learn from and participate in Hope North art-driven curriculum. It is through dance, music, and theater that students heal. And it is how they begin their dialogue with the rest of the world. If peace is to be achieved, we must create a platform like Hope North that provides space for a continuous dialogue of cultural understanding among different tribes, communities, and nations. The victims of these wars need to have a voice that's why I, I, I feel very privileged to have a voice and to be able to talk, to share my story with you. The victims of these wars must have a platform. They must have a voice. In fact, we must become a chorus or peace will elude us. To that end, I'm now driving students back to, to the north, to their former homes, but with very different hands. The students have organized soccer tournaments, what we call peace tournaments, and educational plays, hoping to inspire peaceful dialogue. Hope North is at the moment at a crossroad to fulfill its potential. We must become advocates for peace, not just in Uganda, but in the whole of East Africa. Because the, 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 the problem in this region is, is, is very coordinated. Is very linked. It has the same source, whether it is Congo, whether it is Uganda, whether it is Kenya, whether it is Tanzania, it's, it, it, it has the same, it is so interconnected that if we pretend that they are not, then we shall not reach the core of the issue. We face many challenges as we move forward with all these important projects, but as a person, I made a personal commitment never to stop. I will not even think of it. I will just continue. And that is where I've reached with Hope North. And I always tell my story not because I want pity, but because I want to share what happened to me as a child. What happened to other children? What is happening to children? And what might happen to other children? This is the only reason why I share this story, so that we together come up with a way to stop the reoccurrence of my story to other children. And I tell this story so that through, so that we, we kind of stop, you know, radical extremist people like Joseph Cohn who exploit the desperation and the ignorance of the masses to pursue their selfish interest. Front ideologies or promote 
hate campaigns, compromising the security of many innocent people. It is no coincidence that in many conflicts around the world, the, the people in the front line are the less privileged people. The marginalized, those that have not had the benefit of an education and stability in their lives. These are the people that are always recruited and taken to wars. Therefore, we cannot stress enough the significance of education. And, 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 and when I want, I, I want to, ask, to talk a little bit more about this. When I say education, I mean both formal and non-formal education. In the fight against radical extremist behavior, we must use the tools in both areas of education. And I, I, want to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about radical extremism. You know, it can be defined in many ways, but I want to look at it as the conduct of an individual or group of people with deep conviction, which goes beyond the usually accepted norms and propagates beliefs and principles that are likely to have a great impact on society. A lot of you probably have heard about uh, Joseph Coin. Uh, there was a campaign, uh, the Coin 2012, and the, the video that went viral. I'm sure you heard about him. I, I don't want to dwell so much about Coin per se tonight, but I, I, wa I just want to use a little bit, you know, for purposes of using it as an example of a radical extremist behavior. The Lord's Resistance Army, also known as the Lord's Resistance Movement, was rebranded Holy Spirit Movement of Alice Lakwena. Con randomly took over from Alice, and he claimed that his mission was to overthrow the government of Uganda and rule Uganda based on the Ten Commandments. He also stated that for him to achieve his mission, he needed to cleanse the actually people. Now, for him, for, for coin cleansing means killing. Killing those who either disagree with him or did not believe in his philosophy. And <laughs> this was his justification for the brutal murders and for those he perceived as enemies. Joseph Cohn proclaimed himself a spokesman of God and a spirit medium. Since 1987, he is believed to have recruited between 60,000 to 100,000 child soldiers and displaced around 3.6 million people in Uganda, Sudan, and Central African Republic. Most of the people who followed Cohn did not necessarily follow him because they believed in, in his views, but basically because of the fears he instilled in them. And of course, some people, because of ignorance and because of belief in superstition. There are many reasons why people develop extremist behavior. This includes marginalization of people, especially the minorities, bad governance, selfishness, psychological causes, religion, deliberate manipulative policies. A, a lot of governments have very deliberate manipulative policies. And we know it and nobody talks about them. And as a result, people who fear dialogue get involved in extremist behavior. Poor economic policies, ignorance, or lack of education. I, I want to quote Secretary Hillary Clinton once rightly said that let not leave an educational vacuum to be filled by religious extremists who go to families who have no other option and offer them meals, housing, and some form of education. If we are going to combat extremism, then we must educate those very same children. Much as education is not a watertight safeguard against radical extremist behavior, 
Education increases one's prospects in life, gives someone stability, and enables them to think logically. A person who is educated has a higher chances of paying employment, of investment, and wealth creation. Therefore, they cannot easily be manipulated by self-seeking individuals or influenced by opinions that endanger their person and investment. Educated people have a broader social and political and economic outlook on issues. They are able to appreciate and accept diversity as a positive factor of life and not as a source of insecurity or threat. As Malcolm Forbes said once, that education's purpose is to replace an empty mind with an open mind. A marriage of both formal and non-formal education is essential in helping to mold individuals that are both intellectually and emotionally intelligent. We must fill the educational vacuum and the empty mind with the knowledge and the positive values that can combat radical extremism in its many forms. In the word of the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And we must mobilize all the resources of our villages, both formal and non-formal, to reach this necessary goal. Experience has proved, especially here in the US, that higher academic achievement alone has not deterred individuals from engaging in erroneous crimes related to radical extremist views. In addition to promoting academic and professional success, education should be able to appeal to that in man that promotes the sacredness of life. That is missing in most educational systems. We don't train our children to respect life. To realize that actually at the end of the day we are all mortal, but we must live here for the time that we are able to live. We must live and live well and enjoy. Formal education tends to be too rigid and isolated from the environment to meet the immediate needs of the individuals or community. On the other hand, according to Fordham, non-formal education is characterized by relevance to the needs of the disadvantaged concerned with specific categories of people or persons. It has a focus on clarity and defined purposes and flexibility on organization and methods. Uh, I'm talking about relevance, concern, clarity of purpose, flexibility of methods. These are features of non-formal education, which at the moment we are, we are beginning to dismiss them in most societies. We are beginning to, to look at them as primitive. It is therefore practical, specific, and targets both the physical and emotional needs of an individual and equips one with the practical skills to meet their needs for security, economic, welfare, social, civic, and religious needs to survive in the environment without restriction of classroom walls, fixed curriculum, or specific teachers. It is the fastest way of promoting unity and moral values through such means as religious instruction, correct religious instructions, traditional norms, and culture. In my own traditional society, everyone had the moral obligation to instruct, to correct, or to guide younger generation for the good of society. And, and it is it is for the good of society. But, but what our systems are propagating now is that society is being pushed away and there's a lot of promotion of the individual person. And that is a dangerous thing for our survival. That the more we continue to, 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 to disregard the concept of community, the concept of society, the more we will, individuals will begin to, just to, to use a crude word, just kill without thinking. The, 
Many great life lessons were passed to younger generations through songs, dance, riddles, folk tales around fireplace. I want to, to share with you a simple story that I learned when I was a child around the fireplace. And this was basically used to instill in young girls the values of being a good mother, the value of being a parent, the value of making sure that the family is together and with resources. So I, 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 um, as we always say, in, in my language, we say, do don't want to money you, and then you say, hey, yo. Or do don't want to money you? Aha, yeah. uh -huh, very good. There, there was a very hardworking mother who had a beautiful, beautiful daughter called Njabala. This lady worked so hard. She had cows. She had goats. She had a lot of food. And every morning when she woke up and she wanted to go to the garden, her, her daughter said, Mommy, can I come with you? And the mother would say, no, you don't have to. You are so beautiful. You don't need to soil your hands. What I produce is enough for us. And the mother would go and work. Njabula would go and lie down and just wash her legs, bathe, look good, relax. And the mother would come back. But she was always conscious. She would ask her mother every morning that, why don't I come with you to go work? The mother said, don't worry. You are still young. You have enough time. Unfortunately, her father passed on. And soon, her mother passed on. Leaving this young girl at the age when she was just ready for marriage. Because of her beauty, a lot of men soon came, a lot of suitors soon came, and before time went by, she was married. And when she was married, after the honeymoon, of course, the husband gave her her new home, go to the garden and dig. The man said, okay, now let me go hunt for my wife. He went to the deepest part of the forest, hunted and got the biggest antelope, came back home, and even roasted it for his wife. But he was not seeing any smoke in the kitchen. So he said, oh, maybe she cooked a bit early. And when time for serving food came, she brought the, only the roasted meat. And then the husband said, what about the food? And he said, well, well, I didn't get it. Okay. The same thing occurred once, twice, again and again, and then the husband said, no, this must stop. So he beat her up. Of, co of course, when I say beat up, beating is not a good thing. I, I'm not saying that's something we should promote. We don't do that, okay? But this is what is in the story. I don't, I don't believe in that. So I say it because it's in the, the story, and this is a traditional story. So the following morning, Njabala goes again to the garden. But this time, the all even fell from her hands and cut her. So she starts to cry, to blame her mother. Why did you do this to me? Why didn't you train? And then all of a sudden there was wind, there was trees were moving, and there by her side stood the ghost of her mother. She picked the oar, went to the garden, did all the work, went home, worked, cooked, and when the husband came back, the home was different. He was so happy, he ate, and, but the people in the community had sensed something was not right. The amount of work done, 
the space of the job. Everything was done so well, so quick, and, and in, in big, big, big quantity. So they told, they told the husband, something is not right. And so the husband one day said, oh, I'm going hunting. And the other day, the wife also said, oh, I'm going to the garden. So he went and hid near the garden where she said she was going to go. And while she reached there, she started crying and calling the mother. And the mother came singing as usual. Njabala, 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 tuli insanze muko, njabala, bakazi balima bati, njabala, tuli insanze muko, njabala, 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 tuli insanze muko, njabala, abakazi balima bati, njabala, tuli insanze, and she would show her how to work and sing and, but she was doing all the work for her. The husband saw exactly what was going on. And so soon he called a meeting, a family meeting, and told his family what was going on. So the family said, okay, this is it. She has to go. So this wonderful, beautiful lady was sent away in disgrace. Ladies and gentlemen, for me this story indicates a time when the African people were focused on training the girl child to become a mother and a provider for the family. And this, for me, illustrates that both formal and non-formal education is to create change and move one from one stage to another towards personal growth and enlightenment. Education is an undisputable vehicle for behavior change let us be cognizant, however, of the fact that education can be a tool for evil or for good. It is therefore our responsibility to use the means of education available to us as a tool for good to promote peace, development, personal growth, positive change, and good governance through traditional classroom, but also through storytelling, music, dance, theater, sports, and other non-formal means. This is the best way to fight the forces of radical extremism, and it is something that all of us are called upon to do in our society. And that is why at Hope North, we are putting this in principle, this principle into practice, so that youth can be empowered to direct their own future and their own society. I thank you very much. I don't know how we are doing on time, but I wanted to play one more song. Sure. And uh, this song, I wrote it for my mother. This one is not actually in English. When I was taking my mother away from her home, out of the war zone, to come and live with us, Across the Nile, she kept on crying, and as a child, I didn't know what else to do. So I wrote this song for her, which says, "Mother, it's okay to cry, but do good things, and the grieving will be less." And that's what the song says.
So raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. I love what you're doing, um, and I've been to Africa many times. Thank you. Do you, does uh, Hope North accept volunteers from America to come and help? And also, how can we as a group help Hope North from here? Um. The, the first one is the, the, the volunteer component. I, 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 for us at Hope North, we are creating a space for international dialogue. So just to have someone come from the United States and to go and volunteer at Hope North is very important for us because it begins a dialogue. The second thing is to help. There, there, are, there are many ways that you can support us. One is to continue to tell our story, to make sure that this, what you have heard today, does not stop here, it continues. So that the world is aware and there is discussion, in, whether it's in, in your classrooms, whether it is in your church. Let's discuss, let's talk about some of the challenges that is within that, that, that part of the world. And of course the third one is that if someone has resources, they can make a donation to us so that we can keep the school running. Because as I said in the beginning, as an artist, I started it alone. I need people, I need people to make it go on. And so if you went to our website, uh, hopenot.org, then you, you, sh you should be able to, to support us. Thank you. Right here. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had experienced any techniques or strategies at Hope North that helped bring children together across of ethnic divisions and across potential militarized differences coming from different, um, different army groups. Have you experienced ways to unify p people across those boundaries that have, that have um, kept them so entrenched against each other? Have you experienced conflict between the students and how have you um, dealt with that, those situations? One of the, the, the tools that I've found very useful is just to make them dance together and be happy. <laughs> you know, sometimes we go to, to look for therapy when we actually have it. Because we're looking for only one thing, happiness. So if I can dance and be happy and sweat and and then feel, you know, sometimes if you dance, you reach a moment when you, that moment when you say, that was good. <laughs> that, that, that brings people together. And, and also activities, activities that, 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 that is participatory kind of bring people together. It helps people to open up and, um, and, and, so for, for us at Hope North, we do a lot with that, with, with, with the arts, and uh, it's not something that you can do in one day, it takes time. That's why all the children who come to Hope North, we support them right when they, were, when they are young kids until they get to college and get a job. Because I don't believe in the concept of giving, beginning to support someone, and when they are beginning to, to see that there is hope, you say, okay, we are done. Yes. Any? 
I had a hard time pulling away from the UN speeches of the presidents who are from Africa, but I knew I needed to come here and hear what you had to say. My question is, I've been to Africa, I've been to the bush, but my concern is for all of the young people and they're getting younger in the incarceration places here in the United States. I was wondering if your message had been in with the audience in the prison, would it have made a difference, just as it's made a difference with the youth in Africa? How do you help people who they don't recognize that they're in the same condition as you were when you were taken from your village? They're in a village where they don't have hope. They got that because they didn't have hope and they don't have education. Would you believe that you could make a difference in speaking in, to those kinds of audiences? I, I, I think that, um, um, first of all, I, even in my, 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 my speech is there, that component is there, that as a victim who has changed my past and made sure that I don't look at the negative aspect of my past and pursue something positive for life. I think that there, if I did that, you know, whether in prison or whether in, in schools where you have very challenging uh, children who have very challenging circumstances, I think it would be a big motivation for them. But also that um, um, I, I, I asked a question uh, a few days ago um, at the UN and I, I, I didn't get a straight answer. I think that the, 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 the problem that is here as a, a developing country is that we are propagating too much the concept of scarcity. I don't think the world has scarcity at all. There is so much wealth in the world. What the problem here though is, is that there is a problem of access. Okay, there is a problem of access to resources. So you need to help young people to realize that with time they can change that concept. And they can only change it if, if there is continuous dialogue and that, to see that actually we are not going to benefit much from creating uh, policies that denies people access to resources. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us here at the Clinton School. Thank you all for coming out, and we'll see you at the next one.